Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. In this week's news, growth on M24 may mean sewer upgrades, odd job faces a lawsuit, and Oxford Orion Fish gets donations. Stay tuned. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. In response to customer complaints and media reports, the Michigan's Attorney General is preparing to take legal action against the Oxford-based trash hauler Odd Jobs Disposal. Customers found out that the hauler closed its doors last week by reading about it online with another trash hauler. The Assistant Atten Attorney General of the Corporate Oversight Division, Darren F. Fowler, spoke with Odd Jobs co-owner Thomas Christensen, who confirmed the company's closure and told Fowler they are working to reimburse customers to the extent possible. In addition, law firm Roseman McKinney said that they are investigating the company in anticipation of a lawsuit. Proposed growth along M24 may mean a new sewer is needed. The Oxford Township Board voted 7-0 to zero to have engineering plans created for a new sanitary sewer line that could be constructed during the M24 project next year. The design plans will cost the township over $54,000. The proposed sewer line will run along M24 and be 18 inches in diameter. However, Township Engineer Jim Sharp said the size could decrease. Sharp told officials it could cost over $700,000 to install the sewer line. At last week's Oxford Township Board meeting, Trustee Margaret Payne announced she would like to see a single trash hauler serving in the township. Supervisor Bill Dunn agreed with Treasurer Joe Ferrari's belief that if the township is going to have a single waste hauler, residents should be the ones pushing for the idea. Residents with opinions on a single waste hauler service are asked to send comments to Trustee Margaret Payne's via email, mpayne at oxfordtownship.org. The Oxford Township Planning Commission approved preliminary plans for a 78-unit condo development on East Market Street. Two of its three phases were approved at the May 9th meeting in a 5-0 to zero vote. The project, named Enclaves of Woodbridge, calls for 39 duplex buildings to be built on 18 acres on a combined two parcels on north and south, the north and south sides of Market Street. 15 buildings with 30 units will sit on the north side and 24 buildings with 48 units will sit on the south side. Unit sizes are 15 to 1900 square feet with a first floor master suite and basements. Oxford Township's water and sewer districts expanded last week after officials added almost 200 acres of vacant land to the system. This allows property owned by the Edward C. Levy Company to eventually be developed for commercial and residential uses. The Township Board voted 7-0 to zero to expand both districts to include 53 acres. Officials also voted 7-0 to zero to add four parcels to the sewer district. Oxford Township officials agreed to pay 100% of the cost to spray calcium chloride on the community's public gravel roads, and that will begin January 1, 2020. All seven township board members voted in favor of the proposal, and Oxford Township will, will contract with the Road Commission for Oakland County to do the work. The decision was in response to eight residents who live on Coates and Sanders roads who made the request during the public comment portion of the board's April 10th meeting. Oxford's four neighboring townships including Addison, Brandon, Orion, and Metamora all pay 100% of the calcium chloride costs. And last week, Oxford Addison Youth Assistance honored 37 students at its annual youth recognition ceremony held at the middle school. Police Chief Mike Sowall served as a guest speaker and said he carries valuable equipment on his police belt, but the most important tool he has is the one he uses every day, his mouth. He made the point that if you treat people with respect, nine times out of ten, you will get respect 
in return. He encouraged students to remember this bit of advice. Members of the National Association of Letter Carriers, Carriers delivered more than 35,000 pounds of non-perishable food items to help stock the shelves of the Oxford Orient Fish Pantry. Fish Board Vice President Julie Howard said the letter carriers and volunteers collected 16,000 pounds from the Oxford Post Office and over 19,000 pounds from the Lake Orion Post Office. Wow, congratulations yeah. to them. That's a lot of carrying, I'm telling you. It is a lot of carrying. You want to talk about salt? <laughs> Salt, that chloride thing, I think that's really cool that um, each community will chloride the roads and I know some communities have more dirt roads than others. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, the franchise fees, uh, Addison Township keeps half of our franchise fees, mm -hmm. which is what our revenue is that keeps us going. And that's what they um, told us they were using it for is the, to chloride their mm -hmm. community roads. So I know they've got a lot of roads out there. So I would say all residents in the township are lucky. Yes, I would say also that they just approved you know, uh, chloride for the uh, Oxford Township roads on the side. Mm -hmm. um, residents showed up and they voice their concerns and uh, I want to say the trustees and uh, their administrative group responded appropriately and uh, you folks will find uh, roads taken care of in Oxford Township. Well there's a lot to be said for people showing up at those meetings. Mm -hmm. I mean that was only eight people and it got the entire board to, ch to, to commit to. That's not mm -hmm. a cheap process. Right. <clears throat> Excuse now, me, I think Addison um, said the money that they're keeping, I think they said was 25000 to do their, to chloride their roads. So that's, it's only eight people that took an entire board mm -hmm. to change their mind or change their procedures. So there's a lot to be said for showing up at those meetings. Right. There is a little ray of sunshine out there and it's called Oxford Township. They do dedicate mm -hmm. the full amount in terms of support franchise to fees. the station. Yep. Right, that's right. They give us yep. all of our money. So mm -hmm. we get franchise fees that are charged to you on the bottom of your cable bill. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep hammering this because the governor in January signed a bill that will allow cable companies, Charter, Comcast, and um, AT&T, to keep those franchise fees. They'll be able to continue to charge you franchise fees, and they were initially for um, your community that either had a television station or they could keep it in mm -hmm. their community and use it for sidewalks, roads. Mm -hmm. Some communities pay police officers for it. Now they get to keep that, saying that um, it's an in-kind service that they we get to use their mm -hmm. airwaves, which is something that was um, demanded that we get by the federal government. So I'm I'm still not happy about that. And what what is the most disturbing is very few communities protested that, mm -hmm. and every community is going to lose that money. Every single solitary community in the state of Michigan will lose their franchise fees mm -hmm. if the cable companies follow through with that in-kind service thing. I know I talked to a number of people up north where I'm from in Bay, Bay County, mm -hmm. for example, in Midland. Uh, they're all concerned about this mm -hmm. as well. Well, a lot of public access television stations will mm -hmm. either have to shut down or lose their entire staff and have mm -hmm. like one person covering all the meetings. So you're going to mm -hmm. lose all your government um, transparency right. uh, or you're going to have to show up to those meetings. You're going to have to be one of those eight people to show up to the meetings if you want to know what's going on in your community. That's true. It's really uh, sad. So if you you know enjoy what we provide here as mm -hmm. far as the local news, and this is the only place you'll Valuable. find local news mm -hmm. compared to you know, in the major networks mm -hmm. out there, um, do talk to your elected officials out there. Mm -hmm. Make them aware of your concerns mm -hmm. and that those funds should be reallocated, you know, as they should be, you know, back mm -hmm. to the station so we can keep it up. Our representative in our area is John Riley. Yep. So um, you can call Lansing and talk with John Riley, or even our state senators, they need to overturn that bill. It was called SB 637. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, not good stuff in that bill. And the, the cable companies presented it along with two senators. Mm -hmm. Uh, saying that they need to build out for 5G, and that's mm -hmm. not really 
going to be the case. Yeah. They're going to be able to cherry pick that 5G. Just like AT&T cherry picked, you were told in Addison Township that you were going to get AT&T. It took almost 15 years to get them out of there. So um, they're, they're going to use that money and mm -hmm. the communities won't have it. So the sidewalks that are being cared for or the Addison Township chloride program, that can go mm -hmm. away unless all of us continue to hammer <laughs> Uh, for lack of a better term, our representatives and our senators. I'm, I've even gone to Washington mm -hmm. to try to get them to listen. Um, Debbie Stabenow is one of our representatives and she doesn't even understand mm -hmm. um, that her voice would uh, matter. Uh, she may have signed a letter now, but she hadn't last I looked. So. As uh, John Riley is a, a local guy, he really gets mm -hmm. it. He understands it. Mm -hmm. So he's one of the people mm -hmm. that are and fighting, you know, for you folks yeah. out there. Yep. So anyhow, I'm probably going to keep talking about this, whether it's daybreak or on the news or every time I get a chance. <laughs> um, yep. I'm not abusing you. I'm just trying to let you know that we're working for you yeah. and for our community, and we really want to stay here because we think this imp this uh, community is really important. So that's it for Oxford yeah. News this week. If you'd like to learn more about these stories or others, you can pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper, or better yet. Yet, catch us on our website, occtv.org, on YouTube, and of course the regular cable channels, Spectrum 191 and AT&T Channel 99. Coming up soon, OCTV's very own Cody Wright with School Sports and School, school News with Alexis Ware. And you won't want to miss Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles. Thanks for watching Oxford News this week, where we bring your news closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication To Scientist. In our first story, sometimes it's hard to make out what people are saying in a noisy, crowded environment. A device that reads your mind to work out which voices to amplify may be able to help. The experimental device can separate two or three different voices of equal loudness in real time. It can then work out which voice someone is trying to listen to from their brain waves and amplify that voice. The device created by Nima Mescarani at Columbia University in New York is a step towards creating a smart hearing aid that can solve the classic cocktail pro party problem, how to separate voices in a crowd. First, Mescarani's team worked out on a system that could separate voices of two or three people speaking into a single microphone at the same loudness. Several big companies like Google and Amazon have developed similar AI-based ways of doing this to improve voice assistance like Alexa. But these systems separate voices after people have finished speaking, Mescarani says. His system works in real time as people are speaking. Next, the team played recordings of people telling stories to three people who were in hospital with electrodes placed into their brains to monitor epileptic seizures. In 2012, Mescarani showed that the brain waves in a certain part of the auditory cortex can reveal which of several voices a person is focusing on. By monitoring the brain waves of the three volunteers, the hearing device could tell which voice the people were listening to and selectively amplified just that voice. When the volunteers were asked to switch attention to a different voice, the device could detect the shift and respond. There's still a long way to go before a practical hearing aid could be created. For starters, of course, people are not going to want electrodes in their heads. But Mescarani says it's possible to detect, to detect the relevant brain waves with scalp electrodes or even electrodes built into earphones. There are other possible ways to select the voice to be amplified, such as the direction of person looking or even a manual switch. But Mascarani does not think that people will want to stare fixedly in one direction. A hearing aid would also have to be able to cope with more than three voices and other kinds of noise. This should be achievable with further development. For instance, more distant voices at a party merge together in babble noise that is simple to figure, filter out. Wow. In our next story, WhatsApp has rushed to roll out security fix after concerns were raised hackers could inject surveillance software into phones via the call function. The company says users should upgrade to the latest version of the app. The vulnerability allowed attackers to install malicious code on iPhones and Android phones by ringing up a targeted, targeted device. The code could be transmitted even if users did not answer their phones and a log of the call often disappeared, the Financial Times reported. The Facebook-owned company says the attack 
or a resemblance to spyware developed for intelligence agencies. There are concerns that the software was used in attempts to access the phones of human rights campaigners, including a UK-based lawyer. We believe a select number of users were targeted through this vulnerability by an advanced cyber actor, WhatsApp told the Financial Times. The attack has all the hallmarks of a private company known to work with governments to deliver spyware that reportedly takes over the functions of mobile phones operating systems. The firm said it alerted officials at the U.S. Department of Justice after discovering the vulnerability in early May. WhatsApp claims to have 1.5 billion users around the world, and it released a software update on May 13th. According to the Financial Times, the spyware was developed by NSO Group, an Israeli cybersecurity and intelligence company. Under no circumstances would NSO be involved in the operating or identifying of targets of its technology, which is solely operated by intelligence and law enforcement agencies, NSO Group told the paper. The vulnerability and suspected attacks have been investigated by Citizen Lab, a research group at the University of Toronto. We believe an attacker tried and was blocked by WhatsApp to exploit it as recently as May 13th to target human rights lawyers, said the app, said the lab. On Monday, Amnesty International says it was backing a legal action against the Israeli Ministry of Defense demanding that it revokes NSO Group's export license. NSO Group sells its products to governments who are known for outrageous human rights abuses, giving them the tools to track activists and critics, says Dana Lingleton, uh, Deputy Director of Amnesty Tech. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of School News. This past week, Clear Lake Elementary had their last green team meeting for the year. They also had their annual Plarn party where they make doormats and pillows for the homeless. Wednesday, we visited Dee Shepherd and the equestrian team as they practice and all OMS 8th graders said farewell to middle school at their farewell party on Friday. These highlights and more on our community access in the Schooling Around segment, so stay tuned. This week, Lakeville, Leonard, and Daniel Axford all have their incoming kindergarten information night. Lake, Lakeville is being held on Monday the 20th at 6.30. Leonard's is on Tuesday, May 21st at 6.30. And Daniel Axford is having theirs on Wednesday, May 22nd, of course, at 6.30. All three schools are asking that it be kept parents only. Today, May 20th, Oxford High School is also having their Senior Academic Awards being held in the Performing Arts Center starting at 6.30. Tuesday, OHS is having their graduation rehearsal at DTE at 9 a.m. and Clear Lake has their IB exhibition from 6.30 until 8.30. Wednesday, OSEC is having their capstone night from 5 until 7.30 as well as a Lakeville exhibition at 6. Thursday, Daniel Axford has a field trip all day long, and Oxford High School says goodbye to the 2019 senior class at DTE for, the gra for their graduation starting at 7 p.m. To end the week on Friday, all elementary schools have an early release day, so be sure to check with individual schools for specific times. In board news, if you missed the last Board of Education meeting on Tuesday, May 14th, here's a highlight of some of the talking points. We have Chandler Cheney here. Chandler, if you could stand up, please, and come forward. Uh, Chandler is a student of ours who participated through a, a program that we really started uh, this year called Graduation Alliance. And Chandler has um, done all the work necessary to receive his diploma. So Chandler, congratulations. At this time, we're going to go through our, uh, our arrangement and um, recognizing students in both arts, athletics, and academics at the various schools. Uh, super excited this evening to recognize two different students from Clear Lake Elementary, both second graders, uh, Mr. Reese Rosaconi and Mr. Mason Kramer. I'm also excited to share about the action that they've taken recently. During their most recent IV unit, How We Express Ourselves, the boys drew inspiration from the unit's provocation. Students did a see, think, wonder, thinking routine with pictures of classrooms from around the world. This sparked the discussion of how similar classrooms are organized differently based upon the resources of that community. The boys then got the idea to collect supplies for classrooms that may lack resources and since then they have started collecting. 
So I think it's just outstanding work. Appreciate your boys' leadership. Excellent job. That was footage from the board recognizing students for their art, athletic, and academic achievements, as well as awarding a student with his diploma. To see the full video, visit our Facebook or YouTube page at Oxford Community Television. Remember that if you would like to be in attendance at one of these meetings, the entire community is welcome to come out. They are housed at different locations every meeting, so be sure to check for the right location before showing up. The meetings are always the meetings always discuss policy, educational goals and concerns, curriculum changes, and annual budget maintenance. Community members do have selected times to address the board with their comments set aside on the agenda available every meeting. The next Board of Education meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 28th at Oxford Elementary School. All meetings start at 630. Before we go, if you attended prom this year and would like an opportunity to be featured on School News in the Scrolling Around segment, submit your prom pictures to manager at OCC.org or on Facebook at Oxford Community Television for a chance to appear on the next few episodes of School News. Parents, grandparents, teachers, and students can all submit pictures with a name, a short description of the student, their college they're attending next year, high school memories, or whoever they would like to thank. We're making this all about the seniors. Congratulations again, alumni. And that about wraps up school news for this week, but don't go anywhere yet. Next up is Cody Wright with School Sports. What's going on, Wildcat fans? Cody Wright back here once again for this week's sports report. I can't believe this spring season is almost over. It certainly flew by for us, as I'm sure it did for you. Um, however, uh, postseason action is the most exciting, and that's what we have to look forward to as these last few weeks roll through. Anyhow, let's take a look at what we got from this last week. What a season it has been for our boys lacrosse team. Head coach Sean Regan has really done a great job with these young men. Uh, the boys took the OAA title and now we are finishing up our regular season schedule and preparing for districts. Uh, it was senior night here at home on Monday. The boys taking on Ann Arbor Gabriel. Uh, we honored the seniors at halftime. This team moving on six fine athletes. Uh, we're gonna miss them all. Seth Grove, Colin Grizanka, Samuel Barrett, Brendan Nelson, Alex Russell, and Thomas Wandry. Uh, we wish all of them the best of luck. Uh, after the half, we finished the game up strong, taking the win eight to three. Logan Vachon with five goals, Luke Grove with two, and Jake DeWood with one, not to mention many more. Uh, the boys' overall record now sits at 12 and three with an undefeated status in the league. Also, the boys' baseball team took on Stony Creek on the 9th here at home. It was a close game. Stony was hot at the plate. Oxford did stay in the game, but fell short by the end of it, 8-7. to seven. Uh, On the 13th, the boys went on the road to take on Rochester Adams, falling to a final of 4 to nothing. The JV team also taking on Adams here at home, and they took the win, 7-2. to two. On the other hand, the girls softball catcher Gabby Dinges, a junior, earns Athlete of the Week. Last week she was 8 for 15 with 6 runs scored and she caught every inning for the team's 4 games. Uh, not to mention she is currently one of the players on the team with a 4.0 GPA. We're certainly glad to see Gabby is only a junior and she will be, she will be back for another year. Uh, the girls took on Stony Creek here at home on Wednesday. Super high scoring game with both teams uh, very hot at the plate. But the girls had that extra edge that took the win for them. Final score at the end of the night, 16 to 11. And last but not least, the boys golf team continues to sit at the top of the OAA white division, defeating Stony Creek on their home course, 156 to 164. Uh, leading the team was low scores, Jake Billis and Hayden Durant with 38 each. Also Keaton Cleland and Matt Schultz with 40 each and Chase Mayer and Ryan Hall with 42 each. Uh, the boys are undefeated in the division as well. Anyhow, that's going to just about do it for this week's report. For any more info on these events and more, go to OxfordAthletics.org. There is plenty of game breakdown, statistics, and more all right there for you to check out. Once again, that is OxfordAthletics.org. While you're at it, might as well check us out at OCCTV.org. All of our coverage of these events and more can be found on our YouTube page, which you can access through the website. Once again, that is OCCTV.org. I want to thank you all for watching and remind you to tune in next time. But until then, I'm Cody Wright. Go Wildcats!
Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, Nissan Motor Company said on May 16th that it would for now stick to self-driving technology which uses radar sensors and cameras avoiding LiDAR or light-based sensors because of their high cost and limited capabilities. The Japanese automaker unveiled updated self-driving technology a month after Tesla Incorporated CEO Elon Musk called LiDAR a fool's errand, berating the technology for being expensive and unnecessary necessary. Nissan, which wants to have its self-driving cars on city streets by 2020, has long shunned LiDAR, a relatively new technology that recently has attracted an influx of investment by competitors. Nissan unveiled its own latest self-driving technology, which enables hands-free driving in single lanes on highways on predefined routes. Nissan said vehicles equipped with its ProPilot 2.0 technology for the Japanese market uses a combination of onboard cameras, radars, sonars, GPS and high accuracy 3D map data. The technology to be released in Japan later this year uses radar and sonar sensors along with cameras to compile the three-dimensional mapping data required for cars to see their surroundings. Apart from sonar, side radar, and a round view monitoring cameras, Nissan has developed a tri-cam that focuses on three points to the front and sides of the vehicle to capture a wide area of view. Tesla also relies on cameras and radars for its self-driving technology. Nissan wants to add its self-driving technology to more of its affordable models to boost sales and recover from a profit slump. When reporting earnings earlier this week, the automaker said it had hit rock bottom in the aftermath of a financial scandal involving the ousted chairman Carlos Ghosn. LiDAR is currently used by companies including General Motors, Ford Motor Company, and Google affiliate Waymo as automakers and tech firms race to develop self-driving cars. LiDAR technology uses light-based sensors that fire roughly one million laser pulses a second as it collects measurements that are analyzed and processed into 3D models and maps. More than $1 billion in corporate and private investment has been pumped into some 50 LiDAR startups over the past three years, according to a Reuters analysis in March of publicly available investment data. Still, it is a technology in flux. Initially, Using bulky spinning devices placed on the roof of cars, LiDAR developers have transitioned to more compact solid state devices that can be mounted on other parts of a car. These now sell for less than $10,000 in limited quantities and are widely expected to eventually sell for as little as $200 in mass production. In our next story, NHTSA, the nation's top auto safety regulator, has opened an investigation to determine if a recall of almost 3,000 2015 Chevrolet Colorado and GMC Canyon pickups should be expanded to cover more recent complaints. In January of 2016, General Motors recalled the pickups after complaints that the vehicles lost their electric power steering. NHTSA's Office of Defect Investigation reported receiving 50 complaints of lost power steering in the two nameplates beyond the initial recall. There have been no reports of crashes or injuries, however. NHTSA has opened a formal investigation into a past recall involving 2015 Chevrolet Colorado and GMC Canyon midsize pickup trucks, GM said in a statement, and we will fully cooperate to support their investigation. The question here is why did GM not come back to NHTSA to address these additional 100,000 vehicles, Jason Levine, executive director of the Center for Auto Safety in Washington, D.C., said in an email. Kudos to NHTSA for reviewing the complaints and digging into what could be a dangerous defect. Time will tell exactly how dangerous. A complaint reported to NHTSA April 7 claimed that a GMC dealer told the Ucapa, California consumer that his GMC Canyon was not part of the 2016 recall. GMC is trying to minimize the total number of recalls, the complaint said. The dealer wants a huge amount of money to troubleshoot and possibly repair the issue. The consumer reported that the complaint in the complaint that the power steering failed at least five times, causing alarms in the vehicle to sound and the steering wheel to jerk. Alarms will reset if I stop and turn off the vehicle and then restart it, but that's not really possible at highway speeds or in local traffic, the complaint said. This safety issue needs to be addressed ASAP before someone is injured or killed because of the known issue it went. Across the U.S., multiple complaints stated the power steering failed at a variety of speeds or while the driver was turning the vehicle. NHTSA did not report the names of the complainants, however. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways.